quickly dive into diving into it. August 14 in the morning, we had a 7.2 uh, magnitude earthquake occurring in the southern part of Haiti, as you can see in the map. And the epicenter was in one of the cities uh, in the in the in the in the, in, in the in the south, the NIP. But it was felt throughout the entire country because the, the the impact was really really strong. And to make things to make matters worse, two days after we were hit by tropical storm Elsa, which was which went through exactly that portion of the island which was already affected by the by the earthquake. And we had a tough time uh, communicating. And we do have the our communication specialist that is here with us, and she had a very tough time communicating because we we were we didn't want to be communicating contradicting messages. Earthquake, you tell the people to leave the, the structures that are affected, but it, a hurricane is coming, so they need to shelter. So what do you do? How do you communicate? How do you, and this is going to be the topic of another panel that we probably have, we certainly have later. So immediately after that happened, we, di we dived into the, the, the protocol and we started with damage assessment. And the damage assessment was really heavy with two, over 2,000 fatalities, over 80,000 80, structures that were hit and about 700,000 people that were affected at large in a over a population of 1.2 million for the three departments combined. So that was a really heavy toll and it was a heavy, really hard hit on that portion of the island. So uh, there was significant damage to infrastructures, schools were, were damaged, uh, churches, so, so public areas were damaged, uh, uh, a lot of private houses as well. We even had a bridge that would uh, that that serves as an, as an access to one of the departments that was also that was also damaged. And this is not only not not to mention the the individual houses. And it was very difficult, daunting task to actually do that evaluation because it happened in a rural area and it was spread out in a very uh, large surface. So it was a very complicated task to actually do and undergo. And it was done by one of our partners that actually did it and came out with a good report and, and this is why I can have those figures right now to be to talk about and to show you. So immediately we launched the whole protocol. We activated the emergency operation centers. We do have the central ones, we have the departmental ones and we have the municipal emergency operation centers and we also launched the search and rescue operation. And the beauty of the search and rescue operation was the fact that it started internally. We had our search and rescue group, which is small, uh, with a very small capacity, but it, that was located in the north. So they moved down to the south, and within the next, within the 12 to, t to 18 hours post quake, they were already involved in, in operation. They were jo they were quickly joined by other other teams, uh, such as uh, uh, some U.S. teams, some U.S. USA teams, the Topos from Mexico, the Colombian uh, USA teams. So they all got together and did excellent work and saved lives within the first hours, like, 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 we, like we call it, the golden hour post um, the event, so we could get uh, things going. Of course, when you talk about a quake, you do have a medical emergency, and usually it is a big traumatologic event. You have a lot of wounded, you have a lot of people to take care of, uh, so we had a huge uh, outpour of support, and we capitalized on it because we could, uh, from, from various armed forces of the region, uh, we had the, the mobilization of CDMA as well that actually helped us. So the JDF was also part of the effort. And we used their capacity. So we used helicopter transport so we could move uh, people from the affected area to hospitals and, and, and so they could get uh, specialized care that, that their situation uh, required. Of course, we also had to ad address the assistance, the general assistance. So we had to move NFIs, food, and, and so forth and so on. And within the first month, quote unquote, of the situation of uh, post post quake, we are we had already impacted seventy thousand more or less of them. And the reason why I mentioned this is because the complexity of the response was also due to the fact that uh, uh, there is a there, there is a there is an issue for us to move goods from our warehouses towards the affected area because the southern portion of the capital was blocked by gangs uh, and green wars. So it was a very complicated and daunting task to figure out the logistics. So we had. And that's when we remembered that we had an island. So we used the boats. So we, we loaded stuff on the boats and then moved around and so forth and so on. So again, it, this situation got us to be creative. So we could find solutions because we had to find solutions and keep the ball rolling and keep the, the response going. So we move about, uh, we, we move a, a, a lot of cargo and we, we receive also a lot of assistance from uh, and, and, and help from our part, from our local and international partners. So we could do what we call a blanket response. So we literally distributed and brought things to virtually as many people as we could 
in the immediate aftermath. And then once we did that, we took, we, took a, we took a step back, we used the technology to assess exactly what the impact was, and then from there, we corrected those that, were, that lacked and those that were not addressed, and so forth and so on. So that's the, the dynamic. I, wanna, I wanted to show you this little video for the coordination piece, because what's, what the beauty about the coordination was is the fact that we could have the military, the UN, the Red Cross and the Protection Civil at once working all together, not only on the field, as you can see here, but also at the strategic level. So we could plan and work together and get that response going and impact the people. So in terms of coordination, I think that was the main one of the keys to the success of when I say success, so that's quote unquote, of what we did in terms of response and addressing the issues of the population that was affected. Of course, there was international assistance, and I think uh, my colleague here uh, will, will be talking a little bit more about that. But there was a huge outpour of bilateral aid. A lot of nations spontaneously came to the rescue and helped and brought aid. And, and many of, 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 of uh, nations that you guys represent were there. And I want to take that a minute to thank you guys for that support that you brought. So, uh, but one of the things that was really striking is the is the solidarity because uh, we 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 really had that that solidarity going between Haitians, between foreigners and Haitians, between the diaspora and the, the affected population, and that made a difference. Of course, we we also used the technology so we could actually figure out and identify the axis, the the the, the, the various axes where we needed to emphasize. So, food. NFIs, health, and so forth and so on. And we also use the technology so we could actually map out this, uh, the response and the needs. So we could tailor the, the response in, in regards to the needs. So in each of these departments, as you can see in the, those maps, in each of these departments, we could see where the needs are. Of course, the most blatant need would be water, but also you have NFIs in certain, some, some departments, some departments, people ask more for food. And, and medication and so forth and so on. So again, we took uh, that into uh, into account so we could organize the response. Now, six months down the road, when we were completely done with the response and we started, we handed over to the Ministry of Planning for Recovery and Reconstruction, we did a, a, workshop, a, a workshop of lessons learned where we sat down, we exactly figured out exactly what happened, see what the observations were, Weak, weak points, what worked, what we didn't work. And then from there, we made we pull out a document of recommendations so we can prep better for next time because there will be a next time. That's the, that's the concept of the things. And especially when you're in a situation and you have to work with over 100, uh, 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 over 100 organizations that are intervening at once. So you, you really have to figure out exactly how to set up and to organize that coordination so you can make sure that you, you can get an impact. So again, like, I, like we said, so we did an assessment. We saw and discussed honestly of the, of the strengths and weaknesses. We identified the, and grouped those weaknesses. And like I said, we drew up an action plan so we can do better next time. So in terms of recommendations, and uh, we, we let the, one of the main uh, uh, recommendations were about the, the active monitoring of the response. We have to be on top of it. And when I say we, I'm talking about not only us as a, gov as a government, but also our partners. We need to know what's going on, how do we do it, and, and keep the communication channels open. We also need to work in sectors and not have clustered or siloed clusters. This is exactly the kind of thing that, you know, uh, that messes the whole effort. And also we need to, we, there, there, there was a good coordination with the Ministry of Planning, but we need to also enhance it. Uh, and then we also, uh, one of the points that we identified was the assessment. We need to have assessments that, that are done, that are done as fast as possible so we can have the data and the information for, uh, for decision making. And so it can be done in an orderly but scientific fashion. We are in 2022. There is no reason why we cannot have that technology because we do have the technology. We, so we need to harness it and make sure we're on top of it. I'm going to leave you with two thoughts. The first thought is that in those response and complex response situations, uh, as I was saying to one of my colleagues, there is no one size fits all or custom made solutions. It's always fluid and dynamic. So you have to be flexible. But one of the things that is the most important is that you have to keep the, the people that are affected at the center of the decisions. They are the ones that should motivate and that should always come first in whatever decision or dynamic that you engage in. That's the first thing. Second, second idea that I wanna, 
that I want to, to emphasize on is the fact that we also need to en emphasize and enhance and strengthen the capacity of the local institutions. I gave the example of the search and rescue. Our search and rescue team, as small as it is and as little it means were, made a difference by, inter by being there and by doing those interventions in the first the tw 12 to 24 hours. So definitely the lesson to be learned is to actually reinforce those institutions, and in, my, in our case, the, the civil protection, so we can be better, so, so they can have more autonomy and be more impactful So should the next uh, uh, event occur. So I'm going to leave you with that, and I'm going to hand over the mic to the, to my, uh, to, 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 to the moderator, and I'll be here, and I will be able to exchange, and I'll answer your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, it's it's really interesting the, the experience of, of Haiti and 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 fortunately you have a lot of disasters so that also it's uh, but also the how you've learned to coordinate how to manage that it's really interesting. Uh, hopefully you have also questions after the the panels, but then we will move forward. So thank you very much for that. Now I'll leave you with Michelle Forbes, uh, and she will uh, tell us the experience about managing a volcanic eruption in a COVID context. In, a, in an island, <laughs> which is a lot of complexity that uh, uh, we would like to have that experience. Thank you very much. I will have to stand because I'm short, so I can't see a thing on the, on the screen. But welcome to this session, and I'm going to present to you on the St. Vincent and the Gwendine's context and how we managed the... We had multiple hazards affecting us during the, the last two years. We would have started with the COVID-19 pandemic, and... That went on, of course, we know, for two years. And then on December 29, 2020, then is when our Lasso Fair volcano decided to wake up and shake up and started its effusive eruption. And that went on for several months in the, in the COVID environment. And then with the first eruption on the 9th of April, 2021, and we had 32 eruptions. So it was not a single event. We had 32 eruptions um, subsequent. So that would have affected the damage assessment process, everything, the water situation, airports closed, so you cannot get in and out of the country as you would have liked. I mainly have photos because I didn't want to be too long. So the complexity of the hazard, we had the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a vol volcanic eruption, we also had the hydromet hazards in terms of we had the flooding, the first set of Lahaz on April 29, 2021. And of course, we had Hurricane Elsa on July the 1st and July the 2nd coming into St. Vincent while we were heavily into the whole relief operations um, in country. And then, of course, we had some another health hazard affecting us, the dengue, where we had several deaths um, being impacted, ha happening in the country. Now, I want to look at the whole preparedness. How did we manage such an event? prepared not at all level. It's not an overnight thing. It's something that we were building and working together for years. We would have started way back in 2002 as an organization with support from the World Bank in establishing the National Emergency Management Organization, the plans and the policies um, to go with that. And we would have worked closely with the Ministry of Health because in every emergency, there's a health emergency. And we would have worked closely with the Ministry of Health in, in prioritizing our strategies going forward and working with them over a period of time, establishing in our, our National Emergency Operations Center and the systems that go with it. When the COVID-19 pandemic um, happened, we used the same disaster management system to manage that whole emergency. So our Emergency Operations Center was activated on March 14, 2020. And we had to then transition for the volcanic emergency the week before the, vol the volcano erupted, because by then the scientists started to give us some signs. The Ministry of Health was vexed with me, and I said, oh, you know, sorry, but you have to leave. Later on, they understood why we had to ask them to vacate the space, and they had to operate within a different environment. So in the whole level of preparedness for response, you also must have that political will and that political leadership. And I, I, I can't tell you, what we, we saw what happened in incidents like Hurricane Katrina, etc. If you do not have that political will to guide you in terms of your strategies and plans going forward, you're not going to really advance much. And we had that the case of our political directorate. Now, in managing such emergency, we had a lot of pre-planning pre um, being happening. We know we are living with a volcano, and we know at some point it was going to erupt. It's just a matter of, of, of when. It's not if. When was it going to erupt? And 
we were hoping yes maybe another 80 years but it didn't it did it showed us that it did it in just over 40 years 41 years 42 years to be exact because the last eruption before that was 1979 on april 13th and it has a habit of coming around every easter on during the easter time so you know, everybody was being anxious around the easter and it happened so we did a lot of pre-planning work working on our plans updating our plans working with the ministry of health and we did some things that we had never done before in terms of assigning communities that will be evacuating. So we knew right away there would be about 20% 20, 20 of our population that will be evacuating. And of course, there are others evacuated because of the health hazard and the implications for the ash and the, the lahaz. So a population became increased. So we had over, just over about 20,000 persons being displaced. Regardless of your population, that is a lot. So 20% of St. Vincent and the Grenadines moving north to south. And we have to accommodate those persons in, in shelters. We had 87 shelters that were activated. Not enough shelters, not enough um, um, space to activate. And one of the policy decisions that we made in December, um, before the volcano erupted, the Prime Minister said, you know, well, it's 2020, um, 21 thereabout, and we cannot put persons in schools alone. We had to cater for the persons who are going to be elderly, who cannot sleep on cots, who cannot sleep in, you know, go low, and pregnant and lactating women, and so on. And we actually engaged the private sector the Ministry of Tourism engaged the private sector so we could, can have a set of um, guest houses and hotels available for when persons had to evacuate. And it was really the first time we saw like the tourism sector being integrally involved in placing persons in shelter. And we continue this work over a period of time. Of course, we're living in a, in a different environment, um, pre-option phase where the cases started to increase. As a matter of fact, the high level of, um, when we started to get the reports, because the EOC was activated for COVID, we knew where the hotspots were, and all the hotspots were in the same areas that will have to be evacuated. So you imagine our nightmare, you evacuate persons from the same red zone into, into shelters, and you know that you're going to have COVID cases. Luckily, we only had about 87 cases come out of the shelters in the, in over the, in the few months that we had activated, and that was really good. Only 87 cases, woohoo! but it could have been worse because those were the same areas that, that were being um, um had the high cases. Of course, we had different risks and different hazards to think about once a volcano erupted. As I said, a volcanic, once an emergency, you also have a health emergency. So we had to deal with all the, all the health hazards. We had to develop campaigns and, and, and work with the Ministry of Health even closely to actually give the population inform information. How do you deal with the ash? Because many persons didn't realize once, once the ash started to fall, the water supply is, is cut. So we had no water for two, three days once the ash was falling. And that impacted us even in the shelters even more because then not all the shelters actually had water tanks and people going out and they're getting the ash in their eye. The airport is closed for, seven, for almost two weeks. The airport was closed. And then you cannot conduct a damage assessment in the areas that are impacted because you have the, the threat of pyroclastic flows. And then we saw the first set of lahars coming down, which meant that it delayed the damage assessment process because your safety was, 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 was unparamount. We work with the World Bank a lot in developing quite a few products um, for the health, health sector in, in, in the, under this program so that we can actually continue to inform the population. And we work with a whole set of agencies ensuring that the information was there for our, our, all of our population. I want to focus a little on the regional international coordination. We're looking at building synergies, uh, multiple coordination, multi-hazard coordination. We cannot do it alone. And we had tremendous support from the region. As Dr. Chandler said, we had support from Sidema. We had support from CAFA because we're dealing with the COVID. We had support from the regional security systems who brought the scientists in, who took the samples down to Trinidad for, for, being, for testing. And that, that excellent um, um, co um, coordination. And the regional mechanism worked. Of course, we got a lot of support from the international partners, partners also. But what saved us that we did not have an influx of NGOs into St. Vincent was the COVID because of the restrictions and coming in. And I think it saved us, otherwise we might have been inundated. And I think they went to Haiti instead, but they, you know, <laughs> but it, they would have really, really um, cramp our style, if you want to put it that way. So that kind of kept them a bit. So we didn't have the overnight NGOs coming in and, and making things worse for us. Um, we had a few that gave trouble, but you know, still we were able to control that. You know, and as, we, as, I, as I end, we go forward because we have gone through an, an eruption that has, affected 25%, 26% of our GDP. That's a lot. 
that's a quarter of our GDP for a small population of 110,000. And we would have had our economy retracting already by 6% because of the COVID and the increase in, and, the, and the volcanic eruption. Persons, thousands of persons being displaced. And we are still grappling with a few things, especially on the North, North Coast. So we have the VEEP project now that is started by the World Bank. I think Jared might speak a bit about that and, and how the World Bank is supporting us. And we see the problems that we are having, where we will continue to have for some time on the Northeast Coast, where we have every time in the past where we had, a, it would take an inch and a half of rainfall over about 45 minutes before you have see, see the river flows coming down. Now it's 20 millimeters of rainfall because the, the mountain is bare. Everything just comes rushing down. And that's the situation that we are having in the country now when you see the heavy rainfall. So we have these, as we go forward to our recovery efforts, um, we see that we have to do different things to accommodate for the population in the north part of the country. I have an engineer who in our team, so if you want to ask any questions about what we're doing on the engineering part, you can always reach out to her. But it's really, we need to look at, um, as looking at a little bit of the lessons learned, we look at those, need to look at our disaster risk financing and our recovery frameworks. They're quite, they tend to be quite absent in the region, especially our recovery framework. So that when something happens, it's difficult for some entities to prioritize, some sectors to prioritize. And what we had to do even before the eruption happened is actually look at our priorities that we would need, what we would need to really manage an eruption um, of 20,000 persons. Sadly, we did not really got any assistance before the eruption happened. People did not see it as an emergency until the volcano went bang. And for those countries who are living with a volcano, you cannot wait until the volcano go bang before you actually start preparing. And that is one of the lessons learned. But it's often difficult to convince the finances that you need the support before. You know, so it's one of, one of the things that the drawbacks to preparing for volcanic emergency versus the COVID in that you, you, you don't know when it's going to happen. And hence the finances is not always there. But you have to prepare as disaster management practitioners what you need to manage the emergency. You may not get it. And of course, you're judged by your response. No matter how prepared you are, you're often judged by your response. So if you can prepare as much as you want over the years, but if you do not go to, do a good response, then you are judged by that. So I just wanted to present to you the St. Vincent Grandin's context, how we're managing the multi-hazard emergency. And if you have any questions, my, my colleagues will be here to answer you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, really interesting. Um, I think that just sort of following with the, with the prior uh, uh, presentation of, of Dr. Jared, uh, how we have a, an all sector approach when you are bringing also the private sector to build the shelters and, and sort of having a, a more holistic approach in emergency preparedness. Usually we're just focusing on the government responsibility, but we forget that also the private sector and other sectors of society are also responsible and can help us in this. So thank you for, for that experience. Now we will move to uh, two experiences from the World Bank uh, in Haiti and also in St. Vincent uh, that will give us an idea of what we are performing uh, and what are the challenges that we are looking forward and also what are also some, some of the lessons that again we have to learn that probably we're still not learned but hopefully we'll learn them. Okay, so we'll start with uh, Mrs. Naraya Carrasco. Uh, she works in Haiti and uh, Naraya, to you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with Dr. Chandler to say a little bit about the experience from the bank side because we, we work together and we try to support the government of Haiti as much as we can to be better prepared and, and have a good response. Um, so after the earthquake, uh, the bank tried to mobilize as, as much as they could. And luckily, uh, there are some instruments that are already embedded in the projects that we have uh, at the bank, like. Uh, uh, contingency components that can be quickly activated to provide support to the to the government. So the bank activated three of these components in three sectors, uh, mobilizing 600, uh, 60, 100, 60 million dollars to support the, the immediate uh, response. And overall, then the bank managed to mobilize around uh, 200 million to support also the, the recovery of the country. But all of that uh, requires to have a, a constant dialogue and communication with the government, with the civil protection, to know what, how we can best uh, support. 
and um, also collaboration with other institutions. Like, for example, when we think about the insurances that uh, the, 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 the regional insurance, the CCRIF, they managed to mobilize $40 million for the government in 10 days. And that was also thanks to collaborations with CDB, who is pay paying the premiums or facilitating the paying those premiums for, for Haiti. So we need to be lessons learned in, in that sense is that we need really to, to collaborate and, and see how which man can bring what to the table and try to put all together in a coordinated manner. So we need to not to step in each other, but really help each other. So for me personally, from the experience of, of working in Haiti and being in Haiti just after the earthquake, because because of COVID, I couldn't be there when it happened, but I just arrived just after, after it. For me, it's like we need to think what is needed in advance and have agreed uh, activities that, that we know that we will need because from the experience, you know you will need basic things. So we need to prepare in advance those activities and say this is what we're going to do and how the bank can support. We need also to have a very flexible approach and be very innovative and creative and see what are the ways we can we can find to, to support. But what is more important, and you mentioned it before, is um, and also Madame Forbes have mentioned it before, is we have to be preparing in advance. And for that, we need investments to really prepare the teams from the national level to the local level. Because as they say, we never know when the disaster will hit and we need to be ready for that. So it's a constant work and a constant reminder that we always need to have the teams ready, well prepared, building capacities so that we can act immediately and, and have the, the teams on the ground saving lives. From the difference that, uh, that Haiti was, was praised uh, after the earthquake last year, is that when we compare the response in 2010 and 2021, is that there was a big difference. And the government was there, the civil protection was there, they were mobilized very quickly, the emergency operations center was activated just a few, one hour or something, just after the, the earthquake. And the teams that were trained, also with support from the World Bank, local teams they were already there because they knew what to do they had the training so they were able to act there is still a lot to do we, there is a lot of things that we still can improve but it's possible so it shows that that we can do it but it needs perseverance and investments to support all the process and being prepared it's not something you do as you mentioned just the day before it, it's years of preparations and, and we need to keep that in mind so that will be maybe the one lesson is be flexible be ready to, to change your mind, your plans, plans, everything, because when this happens, you need to really go for it and take your preparedness before with the finances that goes with it to really train your system and have it ready to activate it and, and functioning. Thank you. Thank you, Naraya. Uh, I think it's also relevant what we're talking about uh, building the relation. That's that usually, and, and it, not only on, on, the, on the international side, but also when we work in emergency preparedness, the importance of building the relations, usually it's a long-term process, as you were saying. So it's important that we are, uh, we are really aware that uh, it's not something that happens from day to night and something like really quickly. It's something that really takes time. And I also like the, the concept, I always say it's, investing in, in resilience is not like an expenditure we know that there are uh, dividends that come from investing in resilience and we have to find the, the way in how we can uh, show those dividends to the decision makers i think that's a big challenge also so now i'll leave you with jared who will also uh, give us the experience of uh, st vincent and grenadines and hopefully something else that you want to add jared thank you um, so I'll, I'll start off with the lesson, uh, and I think in this context, uh, one thing we've learned is the importance of agility and the importance of speed. Uh, as Ms. Forbes highlighted, the volcano um, spread ash over the, the whole entire country, so everybody was affected, uh, and the issue of COVID uh, meant that we couldn't be on the ground. So we weren't able to see the disaster, we weren't able to assess the disaster, and we were able to support hands-on. Uh, to support this in a number of ways, we've, we mobilized uh, resources through existing mechanisms. We had a, a, uh, a development policy credit, which we were able to utilize to quickly provide supplemental budgetary support to ensure that existing systems uh, did not collapse, that resources were there, uh, 
uh, to keep the system running. We utilized uh, global uh, remote uh, damage assessment and estimation uh, mechanisms. So we were able to identify broadly what are the impacted sectors, what's the overall cost, um, and we utilize this to both mobilize technical assistance uh, by leveraging uh, trust funds um, and to develop a, an emergency response um, operation. Now, our ability to mobilize trust funds uh, helped in a number of ways. Uh, we were able to support the government of, of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to uh, update, provide guidance uh, and principles on things such as shelter management plans and policies and guidance. Uh, this helped um, both uh, address the immediate needs, but also helping to put in place um, systems that can be institutionalized moving forward. We utilize trust fund money to um, have a, a nationwide communication campaign um, through multimedia, radio, social media, television, uh, paper. Um, and this was critical because we utilize that as, as, as a way to um, provide guidance to, to beneficiaries, to people, in fact, uh, impacted by the volcano on how to, uh, the risks of ash, right? So a lot of these people might not have ever been in a volcano before. They don't know the risks of, of ash exposure. And it was important to provide that guidance, provide that oversight from the very beginning. We also utilize trust fund money to provide technical support, hands-on technical support you know, mobilizing experts that can support the government from all aspects on where supplemental support and technical guidance is needed. And I think this is important um, to move things forward to the next stage and to implement uh, activities uh, where there could be capacity gaps or there's just a sure lack of uh, a sure resources to focus on these. We're talking about a, a nationwide response uh, in many ways. And then lastly, uh, we supported the development of an operation. Um, it's a, a $40 million operation, multi-sector, but focusing on both immediate uh, and long-term uh, risk reduction and, and emergency preparedness needs. And we, we do this by both support from the World Bank, but also crowding in uh, partners from the development community. So, for instance, uh, under this, the, the Volcano Emergency Response Project, we, we worked with the European Union to specifically provide resources to NEMO to strengthen emergency preparedness and response systems, updating uh, capacities, uh, improving and addressing issues of uh, volcano observatory, systems that needed to be put in place to both respond immediately, but also strengthen resilience in the long term. So back to the lessons learned, I think it's important to take an agile approach where you look holistically across the board uh, uh, what mechanisms and systems can be leveraged, what are the assets that are, that are available and how you can crowd in additional assets if you need them, and how you can respond with speed um, that that reach the, the, the people on the ground as quickly as possible because um, as, as Ms. Forbes has highlighted, the impacts were significant uh, and far reaching. So um, I'll keep it quick um, and, and that's all I need to say at this point. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jared. Um, I think also relevant that we were focusing sort of on the, in the local level and bringing the experience that nowadays disasters and response and also preparing to disasters is not only local, we have global tools, we have global cooperation, we have different spaces like this one that we can also use to prepare better. Uh, probably some years ago, it was a very local responsibility. And nowadays we are seeing that there are a lot of spaces of cooperation in which we can help together to prepare our communities to, to respond to disasters. Okay, so thank you very much also for that uh, view. So um, just a wrap up, we've sort of seen that there, there's a, a coordination uh, issue that's really important of having an all sector approach, people centered, 
bringing all the community together. And I think that the probably the the overall uh, view is that we have a need for investing. It's really important that it's an investment and expenditure. And also that there are no natural disasters, that we know that nat disasters are not a cause of nature, but a cause of decisions that we make or we don't make. Uh, and emergency preparedness is a decision that we should make and probably sometimes it's not made in the in the way that we want to. So now I open the, the floor to anyone that has any questions, comments, please. Just one comment about the uh, Haiti. To me, like the biggest difference between 2010 and 2021 earthquake was the leadership. You know, 2010, government's kind of waiting for it, waiting for, you know, what international say or calm or what, right? This time, you guys complete, actually complete differently. Yourself, <laughs> public works, you know, interior. I mean, you guys took the leadership from zero hour. I think it's a huge difference. And even you don't have a president. <laughs> That's a pretty amazing part of it. And uh, most of all, I think uh, leadership of you guys and um, you guys are very agile. I guess being a, being a small government maybe helps, you know, because sometimes I'm, I'm come across this government who may take leadership, but so hard to work with. Stifling, but not your case. So uh, it's to me like incredible. Oh, my name is Kit Miyamoto, Miyamoto International. We work with the Haiti for a long, long time. Great, thanks for the comment. Also, it's important that what you're saying that we usually talk about like hard skills, but also the soft skills of leadership are really, really important. Uh, so thank you also for raising that that um, that example. I think it's really relevant. Any other questions? Come yes, and also you can introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott Dennish. I uh, represent the U.S. Agency for International Development in the United States. Uh, and thank you both for, for sharing uh, your representative stories from your countries. Uh, you, you know, we, we've, we've had programs quite, uh, for a very long time in, in, in the Caribbean and, uh, you know, from and the same thing as the Grenadines all the way to Haiti. And one of the things that we find uh, both in terms of the countries we operate in, but even in our own country, is we are, all do a very good job sometimes. Well, we do a good job in getting the lessons learned. We always don't do a good job in incorporating those lessons learned back into our systems to make those changes, either due to policy, the financial implications, uh, public pressure uh, that are against so many of these initiatives are not popular. And uh, my question is to, to both of you, how do you incorporate those lessons learned from, from the earthquake, from, from the volcanic eruption into your systems? And how do you uh, overcome those hurdles and those challenges to incorporate those lessons? Thank you. Thanks. Great question. Who starts? Yes. <laughs> That's so true because um, sometimes it is beyond your organization in terms of implementing some of the changes or recommendations that are needed. But we have already started, I can tell you that, because we saw the capacity within the system. The national system has been tested. The entire system has been tested. And if you don't take a step back and look at what has worked and what didn't work, and what we need to improve, you're not going to get anywhere. The next event is going to come, and you're back to square one. So we have started you know, doing different things. Um, one of the things we started years ago in terms of looking at our risk financing, where we had a contingency fund that was established by the government, and it wasn't a natural hazard that you utilize that fund first. It was actually the COVID-19 pandemic that used about 10 million of that fund first, and then the volcanic eruption, of course, we had to um, dig into that a little bit. So, so those are some changes that made over the years. What we have to look at now, some of the harder things that you need, sometimes a bit of the political will and the money, those are the things that are harder to come by and also that people do not like change. So the way you, you, you do things may not necessarily be the right way. And then sometimes those are the things that are harder to change. So yeah, yes, you have the lessons learned, but sometimes I think when we do the lessons learned, people don't really speak out the truth because they're, they're afraid of stepping on each other's toes. And that's what I found in our, in our after action review is that it's, it's a bit soft. Persons are not, we don't really want to say, hey, this, this was crap, you know, and, and, and we need to make the change now. And so some are soft that you can actually start making the changes. Yes, you go ahead with those, but those sometimes that you need a bit, a bit of political buying, a little change that you yourself kind of change. Those are, the, those are the things that may remain difficult. But we have already actually started doing some, implementing some of the recommendations. That's it. 
Yes, totally. I think uh, uh, Michelle here summarized it uh, more or less. But uh, the difference, well, the, the only addition I would add is uh, to add up to what Kit was saying is also the uh, the leadership. And again, we 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 knew that. I mean, and we learned that leadership was an issue in 2010. 2016, it was better. And this time around, we made sure that not only at the central level that we made sure that the leadership was on board, but also at the local level, we gave them the lead and we're working towards giving them as much autonomy as possible. Because the idea is, you know, we, with Haiti particularly, is we, we have a very difficult landscape. So access can be an issue. It can take time. And uh, in response, time is of essence. So what we do, we try to which we're trying to change the game by uh, really leveraging the capacities at the local level. For instance, this is one of the lessons that we learn and that we really are, you know, emphasizing on. And again, we're using the tools that we get, the resources that we get. We try to leverage uh, them as much as we can, training, capacity building, and so forth and so on. But also making sure that the people that are there know and take the right decisions and have as much, I could say, capacity to actually take those decisions and move forward. As, as you said, there are a lot of those uh, lessons learned that you cannot apply because it's above your pay grade. It's above all pay grade because it's political, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we try to manage as much as possible at all level what we can change. We change them because the issue is those complex, is complex issues, they tend to not only uh, uh, arise, but they tend to become more complex. It's that it is as if Murphy's Law was there. And if something tends to go wrong, then it will go wrong. And then and the corollary is the worst thing that can happen, the thing that goes wrong is the thing that's going to happen. <laughs> so you have to set yourself so you can, you have to set things in a way so that you can move as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible uh, 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 within that bubble of politics and economy and international uh, uh, things. So again, there is no one size fits all. But yes, uh, let's actually, for instance, the actual after action review we did, uh, in, so we did it on site where the epicenter of the earthquake was. We made sure of the implication of the local people. And we told them, listen, we want to be honest about it. Personally, I went there and I was like, you, this is what you did. And I didn't like it. <laughs> they were like, oh, uh, yeah. So we're going to flip that and we're going to turn it around. I have nothing against you. You're not going to get fired. That's fine. <laughs> you know? But and that's and that's how we you know get the ball rolling. Like I said, it's not a you're not gonna get a hundred percent results, but you get baby steps. And with baby steps, you keep the system going because you are and, and again you have to keep working at two levels. You have to keep addressing the emergencies while you work on the strate strategic, and you have to be doing both so you can enhance the system and strengthen it and really learn those lessons and have that you know that that capacity building that we're all hoping for. Great, thanks. We have time for just one more question. So, uh, yes. Thank you. Um, is it afternoon already? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Judine Tingling Linares. I'm from Belize, and I work at the Ministry of Sustainable Development, Climate Change, and Disaster Risk Management. Um, and recently, earlier in November, um, November 3rd to be exact, we also faced... Um, uh, hurricane, it was Hurricane Lisa, Category 1, um, and we tend to have this perception that based on the skills that are provided, a Category 1, hmm, not a big deal, um, but one of the things that we found out is that when we are sending out uh, messages regarding um, approaching storms, that we tend to um, send out the same message without really targeting um, specific or, or vulnerable population. So I was extremely excited to hear of the work that um, you guys have done in terms of mapping out um, the, the vulnerable uh, uh, communities to really be able to cater to their needs. I think that is um, something critical um, because I, I think as, as you pointed out at the um, in St. Vincent and in and the Grenadines, that also impacts, you have to have an idea of what your priorities are so that you can know how to align the aid to the specific communities that will be targeted. So I think um, I, I really like that you highlighted that um, that aspect of, of, of the work, of the response. Um, I also want to mention that 
um, it is important to document these lessons because for us in the Caribbean, we tend to face um, a lot of, of, of um, disasters, um, but they're closely, we're closely related because we're surrounded by water and all of these things, not for Belize, we're, on, we're in Central America. So um, it's a little bit different, um, but we face some of the same hazards. Um, so I think it would be interesting to um, be able to have a hub where a lot of these lessons can be learned. Um, one of the other things that, uh, well, two more things. So I wanted to um, find out a little bit more about the climate, um, about the disaster risk financing that you were talking about. Uh, is there a specific policy um, that you guys um, have relating to that? Because I think that was important as well. And um, then my other, my other question is as it relates to coordinating um, the different aid coming from multiple organizations. You said in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, it wasn't really an issue, but I know that you know, right after um, a disaster, you have almost like a bombardment of uh, multiple agencies coming to provide aid. Um, and so I would want to know what are some of the strategies that you can use to um, ensure that there is better coordination because um, the needs for people who have been affected are quite different. So you don't want to have everybody, you know, providing food, perhaps you know, building materials is, is more of a priority. So how were you able to achieve um, some of that coordination? Thank you. Ladies first. <laughs> well, in terms of the, the contingency fund, it's something that we were asking for quite a long time. We recommended to the government for, for over 10, 15 years and I think they got a little bit of a push from some of the lending institutions too that said, we cannot keep lending you money and you're not making plans yourself. So a few years ago, our government decided to do this 1% tax, which was a bit contro controversial. And that way we were able to actually accumulate funds over, over a period of time. I know the Ministry of Finance, they're quite happy when I speak to the Director General of Finance, he says he's quite happy with the fund because it's there so that we can draw on it if needed before we have that external assistance coming in and we can use it to, to really boost, boost our, um, our capacity. And we did that especially for COVID when we needed to buy millions of dollars worth of, of um, PCR tests and, and gloves and all those things for the health sector. So it wasn't, it wasn't an easy sell. And I think, it, I think it really, the push really came from people like the World Bank and the IMF saying, hey, you need to set up, a, establish a fund. And they did that. So we were quite happy and we can actually tap into that. Don't misunderstand me. We did have problems with coordination. I can tell you that because you did have agencies, and, but it was mainly local. Um, we, as I said, the, the COVID saved us and coming to St. Vincent where you had the restrictions of staying in to have to stay in hotel for 14 days if, you know, and all of that depending on where you came from, kind of kept people a, a bee. But you did have some coming in or working through local agencies in country, and we still have challenges with the coordination because everybody wants visibility. Everybody wants to say, hey, I'm doing something, and this is what I'm doing, and don't want to coordinate through the national system. But they do create problems because what we saw happening is, for example, i give you an example. A, a, a donor decided to give it farm implements to some of the farmers who would have lost their livelihoods. And some of them were not farmers and have a farmer thing in their life. You know, but they got these implements. And what did they do with it? You know, whereas some of the persons who really need it are not getting it. So you have those problems, you know, happening. And you still have the perception, if Jared gave me something, the government didn't give me. So I still want it from the government. So you have these things happening, you know, and, and it's still a challenge. And I know we are focusing, I don't know if anybody from the Red Cross here, we have things like the International Disaster Response Law that can, we can look at, at, at um guiding us in some of these areas but that is one of the biggest areas to con to to control um one of my surprise was a big donor actually bought um some things that are not culturally appropriate for st vincent and the grenadines we don't squat to to do our business if you know what i mean and you see you saw a, a bit of those coming into the country and i'm like i can't believe an organize a, a big organization would send this to the country without considering it's not culturally appropriate um for st vincent and the grenadines so they're there what are you going to do with them so you still have these issues. I think one of the things to speak about the vulnerable populations, we had been working in those communities for years. Year upon year, we work with the scientists. And I think St. Vincent is one of the examples that they can use of that bridging that whole citizen science initiative. 
you know, we only had seven minutes to present, so we couldn't go into all of that. Citizen science, and we're the scientists every year. We take the scientists to the community to understand the risk that you're living with. We're living with the volcano. It is going to erupt at some point. You need to understand what can happen. And you know, you from Belize and we were brothers and sisters because of the carry population. And one of the things I, I said to um, some of my colleagues, I said, you know, we have been going into these communities for years, 15 years. And it, we see the textbook of the Caribs and how they look with the long straight hair and everything. But never once did I see some of them in the community. But when I went to the emergency shelters, I saw them. And I'd never seen them after doing so much work in the community all these years because they're they not coming out. But they're still getting the message. So it, it, it makes you too, you still have to step back a little bit. Are you really reaching everyone? Because until I went to the emergency shelter and I saw just like the persons just as a textbook, but I never saw them in the community before. You know, so you still have to take some step back and realize, you know, is it working? Did it work? Obviously, they were able to evacuate. We didn't lose any lives, you know, and it was a good evacuation. Of course, you had your challenges. There will always be logistics challenges trying to evacuate 20,000 persons in a few hours, you know. So, but there are lessons learned and, and not everything is perfect, but we learn from each other and we learn from what has happened in the past and we're definitely going to learn from, from these events. Indeed, uh, the experience is similar. Uh, we indeed learn from the past and we learn from our mistakes. Uh, I think uh, we mentioned uh, uh, January, January 12, 2010. Ever since, we've been working and we've been having support from uh, World Bank and other donors and other partners, for instance, to actually do uh, risk mapping. And we've, done, we've done a lot of those and we know exactly what to expect where so we could educate the population. We, well, we will try to educate the population at, to, our bed, to our best capacity so they can be better prepared. Of course, like I said, you try, you do, the, you do your best, but it doesn't, it doesn't work 100%. But that's, that, that's basically what it is. And, and again, it's also, uh, it, all of this re relates to preparedness. You have to be prepared. And being prepared is all of that, is planning, is focusing and identifying the gaps so you can bridge them. Because uh, it's like a matrix. Once you bridge those gaps, you do the lessons learned and you find other gaps that you need to bridge again and you, you keep going. And uh, to go back to the coordination piece that you, you mentioned, uh, this also was one of the biggest differences between the, the management that we did before and the management we did uh, last year is the fact that we had a plan, we had a protocol and we had everyone sit down at the table to agree on the protocol. Everyone was knew what to do and once disaster hit, we all were in, in line. Of course, you will find a few renegades that will try to, you know, flip to the to the cracks and try to do their own things. But all in all, 80%, 80 percent, 80 to 90 percent of the big donor of the big guns and those that we know, they all came to the to the to the office. We sat down. We had a plan and we identified the resources. For instance, one of the things that we did, we knew that uh, for the earthquake, we made a list of resources that were needed, uh, and that list was communicated to our partners. That this was communicated to the diaspora, so we don't end up having a bottleneck of things that we don't need at the custom or at the airport. We had that experience uh, during the 2010 earthquake, and we had a, a crate of Valentine, Valentine chocolates that were donated. Yeah, they sent us chocolates. They sent us things. Uh, they tell to to uh, Michelle was mentioning cultural culturally not appropriate uh, things that were that are said. So we figured that out and that worked well because all we received were things that were part of what we requested so we could actually do that coordination and we had ongoing constant communication with all the partners so we could know what you what we do what what is happening where do we act so we can redo and re revamp the map of actions so we can be as efficient as possible as you could see in my presentation, I showed a couple of maps. There was a first map where we showed, we really we really did that uh, work of collecting data so we knew where we give what. Now, once while we were doing that and we were collecting the information also on the ground, we knew what the needs were. So that's how we could tailor the, this, this response towards what was really needed. And again, like I said, uh, it worked, but one of the issues it created was the time, the, 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 you know, the timeliness. It, it, it should have been faster. We should have had those information faster. So next time, we will make sure that to bridge that gap, so we can, you know, be more efficient in, in that vein. So again, like I said, there's it's no it's not a one size fits all. Like we said, it's a lot of dynamics. It's a lot of flexibility. But again, keeping the big picture in mind and keeping the people at the heart of the decisions that are being made. 
Great, thanks. Well, unfortunately, we don't have more time for questions, but uh, we're going to have a, a now lunch, I think, there. So I hope, and I guess that everyone is hungry. So it's, so we will just start to wrap up. Thank you very much for, for the panelists. I think that we get a very interesting experience. And so the, the questions and the comments, I think that it really brings the what we're saying, that we have lessons, that we need to incorporate them into disaster management. I really think it's inter interesting that, for instance, the, the ministry in Belize, they have SDGs, climate change, disaster management, how we are bridging also those elements together. It's, it's really interesting. So um, just uh, the invitation to, to keep on uh, looking at the work that we're doing on, on emergency preparedness and response, on, on how we can identify the gaps and also how we can work together to close them. I think that, again, the, the key a point here that probably we are seeing it's collaboration and collaboration only comes with good coordination. So I think that's uh, I'm building relations that, that was also mentioned. So thank you very much to everyone that joined. I also think we have people online. So thank you also for, for, for the interest and a big round of applause for the, for the panelists. Um,